The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to The David Pakman Show. It is a new week of shows. Hi to everyone watching the live stream on YouTube, coming from the I Love It When I Wake Up in the Morning and Barack Obama is President page. Also, the We Survive Bush, You Will Survive Obama Facebook page. Check those out. We've got to get right into this, Lewis, and I'm expecting a, 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 this is going to be a controversial situation. Over the weekend, we saw, and really starting late Thursday, uh, we started seeing escalating violence in the, uh, in the Israel area. Okay, Now, Friday, of course, we're off on Fridays, but right away I started getting a lot of emails and comments on YouTube saying, why aren't you talking about Israel today? Is it because your show is funded by Israel? Because you're Jewish? Is it because you want to hide that because you're Jewish, you defend Israel to the death? And so you're just not doing a show on Friday? Now, of course, we've never done shows on Friday, but that didn't seem to, uh, people didn't seem to care about that. Right. Over the weekend, because there was so much, so much news coming out of the area, I tried to do a video clip. Now, I reject the American left-right paradigm on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is that this kind of arbitrary notion that American Republicans are, quote, for Israel, and American liberals are, quote, for Palestine. Okay, I reject that completely, and I have what I consider to be a, a more nuanced view. And the problem is that I realized I tried to do a video pointing out some of the ways that I think liberals aren't really taking the entire uh, uh, situation um, uh, uh, carefully and thinking critically. I tried to do that. And these are the types of comments I got, which I'll read to you, because I've, I'm realizing that no matter what, unfortunately, this is an issue where on what do people want me to do? Do people want me to talk? So first of all, the idea that because I'm Jewish, my view on Israel and the whole situation is going to be invalidated, this is the standard credibility fallacy that we see. When, it, when the right-wingers say, how can you listen to black people on what President Obama's doing? Obama's black and they're black, right? We reject that. But for some reason, it's being applied to me in this case. So that's number one. We're not going to get very far under being that paradigm. Being applied to everyone on this show. It's being applied to everyone on this show. That's right. Uh, even though Lewis's dad is from Iran, and, and uh, while not an, a practicing Muslim, is a Muslim, and his family's Muslim. Right. Right? No, that doesn't matter. So no matter what, it seems that unless I come on here and just recite left-wing talking points about the situation in Israel and Gaza, people are going to say I'm wrong and that I'm biased. So if that's the case, there's really not much I can add because simply talking about the situation in terms where I say, well, let's consider this and let's consider that. Apparently that is bias. That's not typical of our audience. There's something going on with this particular issue. Maybe it's because I'm Jewish. It's very sad where the, people the can't. Funny, yeah. The funny thing is there are only two situations in which this happens. One in which we talk about the Israeli-Palestine conflict. The other is when we talk about circumcision. That's right. It seems to happen where we just can't seem to have anything other than just people yelling at me for being in the tank for someone. Now, I want to give you some of the emails that I've gotten over the weekend and, and YouTube comments. Here's one. At least Cenk Uger from the Young Turks took a clear stance on this issue. David, I find it a bit disappointing you're not taking a clear position on the Israel-Gaza conflict. Why are you so afraid to condemn Israeli aggression? Has this to do with the funding of your show? You see what we're looking at, Lewis. Oh, we're seeing see here it. at a comment that is implying that, hey, I'm Jewish and I do a show. Clearly, the it's reason why Jewish, I'm not taking yeah. the, the position you want on this issue is because I'm funded. It's the, is, is the conspiracy of Jews funding media. Because otherwise can, you'd be condemning Israel, right? Of course. Yeah. So this, is, this is, has anti-Semitic undertones. Ladies and gentlemen, we know how the show is funded. We have a couple of sponsors. We have, like, we have a company that makes our T-shirts. We've got a small bank in the area. We're funded by individual members who choose to subscribe for five bucks a month, right? We, we don't have these big Jewish sponsorships, which I guess is the idea. We depend on every day I check and I say, I hope everybody's $5 monthly payments came in and from YouTube advertising, okay? So that's the type of email I'm getting. Here's another one. You don't think we know some portion of Palestinian footage is fake, David? David, you must think we're all stupid. How effing insulting. There's an example. Again, if I do anything other than just cite the talking points people want to hear, they get mad. So what's the point? What's the point if we're not going to be able to have a discussion about here? It's incredible. Here's another email. Uh, David, this is the equivalent of the right wing showing the global warming scientist emails, Black Panthers at voting booths. 
We all know the left occasionally has some falsehoods. You insult our intelligence. Fact is, bottle rockets don't equal fighter jets. Fact is, Gaza is the world's largest prison. Space. Jews. Period. Jews. Period. And that's really what's at the root of that comment, Lewis. What am I going to add? I can't add anything to that, ladies and gentlemen. If, the co if, if, if you're so angry and you end the comment with Jews, this is what Jews do. It's, but why, why bother? What am I doing, Lewis? Right. I, I would liken this to a debate with Shirley Phelps Roper, where no matter what you say, uh, her answer is always the same. And it, it's just, it's very one-sided and it's unfortunate. Another response, effing Jews. Another, another comment, their Zionist bosses will punish them if I don't come out and defend Israel, which I'm not even doing. Zionist bosses. Again, I, I'm the boss here. That's it. It's just the three of us. This, right. this is it. There's no, there's no big conspiracy. And then here's, here's one that just came in recently. David, I question your loyalty to this nation. If the United States were to go to war against Israel, which side would you be on? What kind of a question is that? It's a question from someone who's completely uneducated and uninformed. Natan, give me your sense about this. I, I don't really think that we're going to be able to have any rational discussion with either side because the right thinks that we are just lefties and the left thinks that we aren't left enough because we're not defending Hamas. Or, you know, I mean, I don't think we have anything to add here. I don't think we're going to be able to have critical thinking. Right. Um, well, on that last point just now, it's a very old idea, the idea of attacking Jews for dual loyalty to another nation, to, their, to themselves, or in this case to Israel, because they are Jewish, they are not American. It's a similar thing that people attack many other groups of the dual loyalty thing. But just as a general point, yeah, I think that uh, what we're saying is accurate, that there is a lack of uh, critical reflection on this issue by the left in the U.S. and in other parts of the world. Right. Just because people lob this issue into the whole package of liberal ideas that they are supposed to subscribe to. And you know what I would say to that, Natan? I, I about, honestly have to say to that, the Israeli military, for all that's going on, has openly gay generals, okay? Have we forgotten about really the sources of liberalism here? We, are, are people forgetting that in the end Hamas did say they were mourning and sad when Osama bin Laden lost because, because they are fighting for much the same that, that he was, the same type of thing? We have to have, I, I have to be able to say that and us to think about it and not me be a, accused because at some Jewish boss who is funding this show, some phantom Jewish boss is telling me to say these things. When we talk about casualty numbers, what can I add? What, what, what can we really add? What, what do people want? Me to just read casualty numbers? And then, because if I do any analysis of what they mean, I'm just pro-Israel. I'm in the tank for Israel. I right. don't even know what that means, though, ladies and gentlemen. I don't see that we can get anywhere on we're, this. We're not going to talk about it uh, until, if this, if this video clip resolves the issue, if somehow we, we can have a, a, a discussion about this, then by all means, we'll talk about it all the time because it's a very important issue. No I question. do have I do have one more thing to say about this, which is just that there there is a serious issue here specifically related to connecting what the Israeli government does with all Israelis and with all Jews in the diaspora. All so over the world. The idea that we would judge French people based on what the French government does and not critically think about whether we should be doing that. I see that as a huge problem here. And this is, I think this is related to those comment, anti-Semitic comments that you were reading earlier, Dave. No question about it. No question. So that's where I'm going to stop for today, okay? I don't think we're, you know, you can get the numbers of what's going on anywhere you want. I don't think that, that that's why you're coming here. People usually come here because they want either a different perspective or on some issues they want some kind of humorous perspective or something. It doesn't seem like I can provide that. OK, it just doesn't seem like it, because whatever I try to do, if people just want extreme left talking points on Israel, Gaza, without any kind of introspection or analysis, that it's not it's not worthwhile. There's plenty of other things to talk about. So we'll see how this continues. We'll see what the comments are on this video and what emails we get. And then we'll see, Lewis. I think that's that's where we're at. That's fair. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. I've got a ton of stories to talk about. Brian Fisher's joining me later so that you don't want to miss that. There is a Virginia Republican who is saying that disabled children are God's punishment for having an abortion. There is an internet storm. There's a specific type of storm. We'll just call it a storm, Lewis, to avoid the seven dirty words brewing.
for Virginia delegate and failed Republican Senate candidate Bob Marshall. He claimed that disabled children are God's punishment for having an abortion. He says, as it's been reported by the TimesDispatch.com, disabled children are God's punishment to women who have aborted their first pregnancy. We've actually heard this before. This isn't the first time we've heard it. And then later he said, listen, I certainly could have used better words to explain the medical research findings which show a high incidence of complications following induced abortions. Uh, he went on to elaborate, and then here's where it gets interesting. He says, in the Old Testament, the firstborn of every being, animal, and man was dedicated to the Lord. There's a special punish punishment Christians would suggest. I read this and was left speechless. Just when you think this type of, of absurd rhetoric has hit rock bottom, they managed to dig themselves even deeper into the hole. Is there a limit to the Bible-toting lunacy? I mean, listen, this, is, this is a Bible explanation for disabled children or punishment for abortion. Well, it's one interpretation of, of a Bible explanation, and it's a wrong one. I, I guarantee you there are plenty of biblical scholars who would claim that this man knows nothing about the Bible or, um, or what it preaches. Right. But, I mean, luckily this is on the decline. We know this is on the decline, and it's, it's stuff like this. B but because it's aging out, essentially. Right, right. I mean, I, I think most young people could look at this and, and think critically about it and think, wow, this is ridiculous. I'm never going to vote or support someone who is insane like this. Going from the, the abortion stuff to the race stuff, a Maine Republican chair defends himself against comments he made. Initially, he made these comments saying that, uh, well, actually, let me just play the comments for you. He made the, this is, um, this is Br Charlie Webster. And he is being accused of racist, uh, of being racist after, after making the following comments regarding black people voting in Maine. Take a listen. Now, in some parts, some parts of the state, there were, for example, in some parts of rural Maine, there were dozens, dozens of black people who came in to vote at Election Day. <laughs> Everybody has the right to vote. But nobody in town knows anybody that's black. <laughs> How did that happen? I don't know. We're going to find out. I, I, I think it's a problem. I yeah. think it's a problem. Where did that happen? In several rural Maine towns. Uh-huh. Okay, in, so there in, it uh, is. In some parts Charlie, uh, Charlie Webster. Dozens of black people? Obviously something is wrong. Couldn't you just look at the census instead of speculating? Nobody in town knows black people, so where did they come from? Well, does the census say that there are black people there? That, that would be step one for me. Clearly, there is some radical group that drove from Mississippi up to, uh, right. up to Maine yeah, especially, to, just to vote. Why go uh, to Maine to skew the vote where there, it's not in play? Right. Why waste your time br right. bringing... And, and also, if the idea is to skew the vote and you know there's not actually black people there, why not bring in white people to skew the vote so they don't attract attention? I mean, this is yeah. the height of absurdity. As if, as if dozens of black people would be enough to even throw it in the other direction. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Yeah. And then, no, let, let's go to the apology. Okay. This is the best part. When he, he had to deny his racism, uh, uh, the racism claims. This is the best, Lewis. This is the best. Quote, there's nothing about me that would be discriminatory. I know black people. I play basketball every Sunday with a black guy. He's a great friend of mine. All that's missing is saying he's got a biracial grandchild. That, right. Right? That's, that's all we're missing here. I really doubt this guy plays basketball. I'd still really like to know. <laughs> I, I'd really, and by the way, is, is even the basketball thing a racist implication? I mean, I don't know how far we want to take it, but this right, guy's right, digging right. pretty deep. I still want to know where he thinks the dozens of black people came from, if not from Maine, and why is someone trying to influence the Maine election that's not even in play? I have no idea. Yes. Very odd. Well, let's start with a census. We'll, we'll take it from there. Yeah. Tyler Allred has been sentenced for manslaughter. What has the sentence included? Going to church. Tyler Allred is an Oklahoma teen. He's been convicted of manslaughter and been sentenced to 10 years of probation with requirements that include regularly attending church. He's now 17. He had been drinking when he crashed a pickup truck around 4 a.m. back uh, about a year ago, just under a year ago. The accident killed his friend, 16-year-old John Luke Doom, or maybe it's pronounced dumb, I don't know, who was a passenger in the vehicle. Now, Allred wasn't legally drunk, but he is below the legal drinking age, so that means that he, no matter how, how much you've had, you are considered legally under the influence of alcohol. He pled guilty in August, and uh, he pled as a youthful offender. So nobody wanted to see him behind bars in his family. 
And uh, the sentence from Judge Mike Norman gave him a 10-year deferred sentence, probation in other words. And in order to stay out of prison, he has, he has to graduate from high school, graduate from welding school, take drug, alcohol, and nicotine tests for a year, wear a drug and alcohol bracelet, go to victim's impact panels, and go to church for the next 10 years. Obvious issues with the separation of church and state, according to a number of different law professors. How can you force someone to do religious activities as part of a punishment? This is such a clear violation. And it's not the first time we've covered it either. Yeah. Uh, would you rather go to church for 10 years or prison for 10 years? Well, I mean, that's a little bit of a silly thing. Of course, I would rather go to church for 10 years than prison if I had the choice. That being said, uh, this, this really doesn't make any sense. Now, Allred's attorney said, my client goes to church every Sunday. This isn't going to be a problem for him. Let's put aside for a second all of the church and state separation issues that, that are going on here. Let me get this straight. He's been regularly attending church already, which clearly didn't work in preventing him from driving drunk and committing this crime of manslaughter. And the judge sends him to the exact place that didn't work in helping him stay out of trouble. Does anyone get this, Natan? Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. But uh, I am worried about the constitutional issues at play here. Um, this is even if the person is going to the same pastor that he was going to in his civilian life, the state can't can't be the one that's establishing that. Absolutely. And the way some people have deluded themselves into thinking that religion can solve all of life's problems is also unsettling and damaging to society. Isn't this ruling a version of the Muslim Sharia law that these Christians claim to oppose and be worried about? Isn't it just a Christian version of it? Of course. And things get really bad when you've got people claiming to be constitutional experts who claim that, well, they know what the Founding Fathers really meant, and the Founding Fathers were very religious. Of course. And so clearly, right. uh, this, is, this is what we must do. It's Monday. Let me make a quick book recommendation for you, made possible in part by A Fashion of Bastards by Joanna Louise Johnson, which is a frantic plunge into a web of conspiracy, reaching the Middle East oil fields to a plot to suck the vital waters of the Great Lakes dry. Find it on Amazon.com. Today's recommendation, I just finished this two days ago, Lewis. Excellent book. Fountains of Paradise by Arthur C. Clarke. Now, Arthur C. Clarke is one of my favorite authors. The entire Space Odyssey trilogy, the entire Rama trilogy, the incredible book Childhood's End. It's all great. This is a new one that I read from him. It, the book's obviously not new. It's from the 70s, just new to me. It's interesting for a number of reasons. Number one, it is kind of a cool uh, space exploration book. Okay, And it's interesting because years after... Arthur C. Clarke wrote this, it actually ended up that his idea of a so-called space elevator is actually potentially viable as a way of launching into, uh, into, into orbit. But it's also really a good perspective on the political behind the scenes of trying to get big space exploration projects off the ground, proverbially and literally. I highly recommend this book, whether you're a sci-fi person or an Arthur C. Clarke fan or just into very good stories with great character development. Fountains of Paradise by Arthur C. Clarke. I give it two thumbs up or ten fingers up. I don't know. I need some kind of a rating system. Really, anything I recommend, I just recommend. That's How about it. just stars? If it's on, no, I, I would just say if it's on our, my Monday book recommendations, then I wholeheartedly recommend it, period. It gets David's highest recommendation. Exactly. On today's bonus show, we're going to talk about a quadriplegic rapist set to be released from prison because it costs too much to care for him. We'll also talk about Mitt Romney slamming the media. We'll talk about diving pigs and whether it makes for better pork. I'll reveal whether I even eat pork because after all, Lewis, as people pointed out, I am beholden to the Jewish lobby apparently, even though we got no money from them at all. You don't want your boss to fire you. No, I don't want to be fired by my Zionist bosses. Right. Get the bonus show, davidpackman.com slash membership. That's actually how the show is funded. Sign up. We'll take a break. Plenty more after this. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.
Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Welcome back to the show. Today's new member of the day made possible in part by liberalbias.com. When the facts don't agree with Fox News, how do you know which one is right? You head over to liberalbias.com to get all the answers. Anthony Carnahan. Anthony Carnahan is today's David Pakman Show member of the day. It's great to have him aboard, Lewis, isn't it? Of course, yes. All we, members are greatly appreciated. We do need more members named Anthony because we have, uh, we, we now have uh, too many that are later on in the alphabet, and we need to skew the, f the first letters of the alphabet, I think. Well, I mean, we, we can't actively do anything about that. No. We'll just have to hope that we get more A's. Yeah, absolutely. We've been hearing this story about how Hostess, which makes Twinkies, is going out of business because of unions. I don't even want to waste a lot of time on this except to tell you the facts that, are, that that's just absolutely not the case. The CEO got a raise from $750,000 a year to $2.2 million after they declared bankruptcy and then turned around and asked workers to take more cuts on top of the cuts they had already taken in the last bankruptcy. And, of course, we now are hearing that it's from the right wing that it's just the unions when that's that's just absolutely not the reality there's so much data indicating that that's not the case the workers were being asked to accept cuts top executives got massive raises hostess was about to enter bankruptcy investments that had been comp that had been promised as part of the restructuring of the previous bankruptcy never happened but the problem is that bakers didn't want to have their salaries cut by eight percent that's, that's why the company declared bankruptcy. We've got to think critically here, Lewis. It's unbelievable. They stopped paying into the employee pension, owing $160 million. The executives received huge pay increases, but we're going to br blame those unionized workers who make less than 20 bucks an hour. This is just, it's another attack on organized labor, which, by the way, is not that strong. There, most people aren't in unions. Very small percentage of people are unionized in this country. Ultimately, you can probably blame the, uh, the health craze for, for the fall of, of Hostess. I was on a right-wing radio show on Friday, and I said, you know what? I honestly don't really care that much. People shouldn't be eating Twinkies anyway, although I respect their right to eat them. But if the company just isn't sustainable because people aren't buying the junk food, it's not sustainable. And again, not that I don't care about the workers, but making the point that unions are the last people we should be blaming for this. Right, right. Easy to point the finger there, though. John Metz is a Denny's franchisee and also owns Hurricane Grill and Wings. And he is imposing a surcharge for Obamacare. This is a little bit unusual. He is going further than to cut workers' hours. He is actually saying he's going to add a 5% surcharge to people's bill to offset what he believes will be the costs of Obamacare and he's going to reduce employees' hours as well. He says, if I leave prices the same, but say on the menu that there's a 5% surcharge for Obamacare, customers have two choices. They can pay the surcharge and tip 15 or 20%, or they might reduce the amount of tip that they give to the server. Hell of a guy. Instead of saying, huh, for 5%, I could cover everybody with health insurance. Instead, I'll set it up so that my customers will give my employees who I depend on to run this business even less money. Hell of a nice guy. Well, I mean, the, the tip system is, uh, I'm not a big fan of it to begin with. I mean, even that in itself is originally something that people would do to make customers pay more and so the business could pay less. Right. See what happens when you have a problem where the solution isn't just more cheese? This type of stuff happens, Lewis. Right. Um, I guess now we have to start boycotting Papa John's and Denny's. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> right. We don't need you to don't do anything anyway. different. <laughs> well, this is just one one Denny's owner. Uh, he owns a lot of Denny's. Oh, yeah. Okay. Do this. Uh, why not? Uh, the other thing also that nobody's done yet is why not do the surcharge and brag that you're providing all of your all of your employees health care. You know that there are so many people that would go out of their way to support your business if they knew you were providing everybody health care as a result of Obamacare. Right. You know. Sorry. Go ahead. No. no go, go ahead. ahead, ahead. Tom. Yeah, I was just gonna say. I mean, honestly, from my point of view. Um, you cannot, I, I wish the system weren't such that business owners have to provide health insurance for their employees because the natural self-interest of a company is to reduce their costs and to give the worst benefits. There are isolated, uh, you know, altruistic examples of business owners, but the reality is that a person's health care shouldn't depend on their job. Absolutely. Also, a lot of bad business decisions overall being made as a result of Obamacare and, Arizona, and of President Obama's re-election. An Arizona gun store called Southwest Shooting Authority in Pine Top, Arizona. Wrong picture, though, Natan. 
an Arizona gun store is refusing to sell guns to anyone who voted for President Obama. The owner named Cope Reynolds took an ad out saying, if you voted for Barack Obama, your business is not welcome at Southwest Shooting Authority. Similar sign is on the front door. Now, I know that it's probably more Republicans than Democrats who own guns in Arizona, but Arizona was a pretty split state. And to basically tell half of the population that you don't want their business, it's just a bad business decision. But it's, it's one I'm glad that this person is making because a person like this clearly should not be involved in a, in a business like this. In a sense, it's kind of a non-starter because if you voted for President Obama, you probably have the common sense not to do business with people like this anyway. I mean, this is, this is clearly another person who has no concept of what either candidate had done in terms of uh, weapons in this country. Well, that's the thing. President Obama has expanded gun rights during his first four years. But uh, facts. Okay, Mitt Romney was never president, but while he was in Massachusetts, he like four or five times increased the cost of gun ownership right. and licensing. These are facts, Lewis. These people don't care. They want to live in their fantasy world. I hope the guy goes out of business as a result of this insane decision. I think I think ignorance is bliss, David. I think it is. Yeah. Let's take a break. Facebook.com slash David Pakman show. So close to 10,000 likes. Hopefully within a week, week or two, we'll be there. Facebook.com slash David Pakman show. We'll take a break. Next, my interview with Brian Fisher. You're not going to want to miss this. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Brian Fisher is the American Family Association's Director of Issues Analysis and host of Focal Point on AFR Talk. We had a wide-ranging interview with him that went way longer than what we can fit into the show. So the entire interview is up on our YouTube channel. Here's part of that interview. Check it out. I want to go through, we've had a number of different guests on the show, and they've expressed a lot of different ideas. And I want to just run some of them by you to see kind of which, which sect of the anti-gay community are you a part of. So first of all, the Westboro Baptist Church argues that, quote, God hates fags. Is that an idea specifically that you subscribe to? That is absolutely, flatly, totally, 180 degrees wrong, David. Okay. The Bible says the Bible says that God so loved the world, that's everybody in it, that includes practicing homosexuals, that includes former homosexuals, he so loved the world that he gave his own begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Westboro Church is 180 degrees out of phase with reality, with truth, and God's word on that. Would you be willing to, to debate one of the people from that church on the show, potentially? Oh, sure, that'd be fine. Okay, I think that would be interesting. Okay, uh, the idea that homosexuals should be put to death. No, we believe they ought to be helped. Okay, okay. Um, it's, uh, it's like, uh, see, I, I liken homosexual behavior to intravenous drug use. According yeah, no, you and Paul Cameron both, yeah. Right, as according to the Centers for Disease Control, the uh, risk to human health in homosexual behavior are about the same as they are with intravenous drug abuse. So my position is whatever policies we adopt to help people lick the problem with uh, injection drug abuse, that's what we ought to use to help homosexuals get free of their addiction. Okay, so my next one was going to be, do you agree with Paul Cameron that homosexuality, homosexuality is like drug usage? So we've got a yes on that one. Gord well, Gord again, yeah. and again, but, but again, David, that's not Paul Cameron. That's not me. That's the Centers for Disease. No, control. I understand. You say it's it's, it's back. Uh, former no, Navy I'm, chaplain. I'm saying, David, I'm saying the Centers for Disease Control say it is. I'm just agreeing with the Centers for Disease Control. You're now, just I'm not a familiar with, Paul, with what Paul Cameron has said, but if he's agreeing with the Centers for Disease Control, then we both agree with the Centers for Disease Control that the risks to homosexual behavior are the same as injection, injection drug abuse. Uh, former Navy chaplain Gordon Klingenschmidt has indicated that a way to rid people of homosexuality and what he considers homosexual demons is through exorcisms. Is that something you subscribe to? Well, I think there's no question that there are spiritual factors at work in this. That are they demons? That using spiritual weapons of our warfare, according to the New Testament, can be effective. Huh. We know that people can get delivered from homosexual behavior. The former president of the American Psychological Association, Nathan Cummings, he's seen that happen in his own private clinical practice. <laughs> he said, seen people get free 
of homosexual behavior and change their sexual orientation. So it certainly is possible. There may be spiritual factors at work. If there are, then the power of the gospel, the name of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit can be of enormous help. And an exorcism might be a way to do that. Well, we believe in the reality of spiritual forces, just like Jesus did. You got a problem with you got a problem with demons, David. Your problem's not with me; it's with Jesus Christ, because He believed in them. Hey, I, I have no problem with anybody here. Uh, and last thing, do you believe that uh, gay couples or lesbian couples cannot be good parents? It's impossible. They cannot be good parents. No. And Mark Regnerus's research at uh, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Regnerus, we've got to stop right there. The Regnerus study has been widely debunked. It's nonsense propaganda. Let's use something other than the Regnerus study. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, we can't do that, David. Maybe debunked by your friends, but the University of Texas, uh, they have a quality control office to monitor the research that's done under the name of the University of Texas. They signed off on Regnerus's research. Said they signed off on it at the time, but as we know now, it's a completely no, debunked. They signed spoke. off on it. They said this research is appropriate. The methodology was fine. It was this both. is an important contribution to the discussion over this issue. So the University of Texas has signed off on it, David. I don't know who your friends are that claim they've debunked it, but the University of Texas But putting that aside for a second. It's their name. But hold it, David. Just it's talk their me name. through why it's they can't be good name. parents. Hold it, hold it. It's their name. It's their reputation that's on the line. They're not going to sign off on faulty methodology because that will affect their name and their reputation as a research university. Okay, so, but can you give me some at least person, I was talking to you, like, do you have anecdotal evidence or anything you can give me of why you think two individuals in a relationship of the same sex can't be good parents? Like, tell, tell me the story of why. Because fathers offer something different and unique to their children and mothers offer something unique and different and irreplaceable to their children. A mother cannot offer to a child what a father can. A father cannot offer to a child what a mother can. That's why God designed it. Well, that's because of God's design. So what about parents, single parent households parents. then? Like would one mother be better than two mothers if the choice is there's a single parent or there's there's two, two, two female parents? What about that? Well, if you look at the social research, David, we know what the absence of a parent means to a child in a home, what the absence of a mother, what the absence of a father means to a child. They're more likely to suffer emotional disability, lower academic performance. But what you're saying is then a single parent in their adult life. And what Regner has discovered yeah. is you have two same-sex parents, you have a lot of the, exactly the same pathologies. In fact, Regner has looked at 80 different outcomes. Yeah, but the Regner is, please let's not talk about Regner. I'm talking to Brian Fisher here. Well, David, you can talk about anything you want. I'll talk about Mark Regnerus because the University of Texas has signed off on his research. Yeah, but you're and losing credibility. It's been debunked. I want to talk to Brian stop, Fisher. Stop, stop, it's get, it's making sorry. you angry. I know it's agitating me. you. Okay. Well, David, you're talking to me, and you want to know what I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about Mark Regnerus' study. But explain to me the experience David, of being in that household. David, interview, David, he talked to adults that grew up in same-sex households. You can't get research that's any more solid than that. And they're adults, so they're able to reflect back and look at the long-term impact yeah. of being raised in same-sex households. Now, Regner said there's 80 outcomes I measured. In 77 of those 80 outcomes, children that were raised in same-sex households performed more poorly or performed poorly compared to children raised yeah, but, in Yeah, but Brian, it's been widely debunked. You should check out Abby Goldberg, uh, Professor Abby Goldberg's research. I mean, the, the study the study's bogus, but I guess we're bogged down in that. You know, I on, honestly, I want to be, be very clear. I do feel kind of sorry for this anti-gay movement because you guys are going to lose, and this is going to be like when people were against integration, and it's going to be sad when we look back at it, being on the wrong side of history. I do feel bad for this movement. You and the chaplain and the God Hates Fags and Paul Cameron, it's a sad state of affairs. I, I really do. Uh, I, I wish you the best, though, in all seriousness. Well, the, the parallel with integration is absolutely false. I know you uh, think that. And, and no, you know, I know you it think that. Because, because race is immutable. You're born that way. And people are born gay or straight. Black. I know. But no, no, they're not born gay. When uh, did you decide to be straight, make... Brian? How old were you? What's... <laughs> David, people are not born gay. In but fact, so when did you decide you to be straight? How old were you? A researcher like, uh, at Columbia and a researcher at Yale. They did a longitudinal study. Yeah, it was very longitudinal. Also. If if student if kids are born gay, if people are born gay, then if you have two identical twins, they both ought to be gay. If one of them is gay, the concordance rate ought to be 100%. Instead, it's between five 
and 7%. So that's proof. Yeah, I know that identical they, twins that are gay, and I know some that not, aren't. They're not that. born that way, and you have met ex-gays. I've met ex-gays. I have. No, I've never met any ex-gays. Straight, that, yeah, straight, no. Well, I have, and I've had But Brian, Brian, when did you decide so to be straight, is, though? So the point is, David, it's just like Colin Powell said, the parallel with race when it comes to homosexuality is convenient, but is it is invalid. I'll stand with Colin Powell on that one. But Brian, uh, when when did you decide to be straight? I will stand with Colin Powell. So you don't have an answer. Okay. Could you be gay now? Could you change your attraction to men now? The parallel is convenient, but it is invalid. And David, the point here. I hope is you don't stand with Colin Powell on that Iraq information too. Sexual behavior is always a matter of choice. That's the bottom line. So could you change your attraction to men? I know you can control your behavior, but could you also change your attraction to men? David, David, listen to me. You're not answering any of the questions, though. Listen to me, David. Yeah. Sexual behavior is always a matter of choice. But I'm that talking about attraction. Your question. I'm talking about attraction. Attraction, attraction doesn't matter. Really? Because it's what you do with that attraction that is the issue. You can ask Tiger Woods yeah. what happens when you yield to every sexual <laughs> attraction that you feel. It'll destroy All your right. life. So sexual we're not here when you chose to be sexual straight. Behavior, yeah. Sexual behavior is always a matter of choice. <laughs> okay. So maybe next time you can tell us what age you were when you said, I will now decide whether to be gay or straight. I guess we can't get that answer now. We've been speaking to Brian Fisher, of course, Director of Issues Analysis at the American Family Association, host of Focal Point on AFR Talk. Think about, would you be able to just change your attraction to men? That would be a fascinating study, I think. Uh, we, we will examine that further next time. Brian Fisher, thank you. Hey, it's always a pleasure to chat with you, David. All right, take care. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Please consider supporting us by becoming a David Pakman Show member at davidpakman.com slash membership. You can also grab hoodies, zip-up hoodies, and T-shirts made from 100% recycled materials and produced sustainably at davidpakman.com slash gear. Two great ways to support the show, Lewis. Fantastic. There's a gene that has been found that is believed to be able to predict the time of people's death. This is pretty interesting. My genes can't do that. I, I mean, they keep me warm, but I right. just, you know. There's common, Lewis doing puns now, apparently. There's common gene variant, uh, there's a gene variant that influences when you wake up each day. And it appears also influences the time of day that you'll die, okay? So there are some gene mutations that have been found which can adjust the kind of natural clock in humans, which means that sometimes there's entire families where people wake up at 3 or 4 a.m., or they can't stay up much past 8 o'clock at night, so on and so forth. There's new research into this, which has been published in the Annals of Neurology, which suggests that there's a gene variant that affects virtually the entire population and is responsible for up to an hour a day of your tendency to be an early riser or a night owl. And it also demonstrates that it influences the rhythms of people's day-to-day -day lives, including the time of day that you are most likely to die. This is in the November 2012 issue of the Annals of Neurology. It could definitely affect the scheduling of medical treatments and shift work, as well as monitoring critically ill patients based on this predisposition to die at certain times of day. Incredible. Very, very strange stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that anything can predict the time of day when you it's die. Not, it doesn't predict when you will die. Right, I know. It simply I mean, is it, a predisposition to die during certain times of day. Certain, right, right. I still, I find that very strange. Uh, this is the work of uh, Chief of Neurology at uh, BIDMC, Clifford Saper. And uh, this is also, um, th th it's just incredible. I encourage you to read the entire study. It's quite a long read. But long story short, there is a, uh, a, a, there's a genotype. There's a single nucleotide near a gene called period one, which varied between two groups that differed in their wake-sleep behavior. 
at the particular site in the genome, 60% of ind individuals have the nu nucleotide base A, and 40% have nucleotide base G for guanine. Basically, there are these two sets of chromosomes, and in an individual, it's a 36% chance of having two A's, a 16% chance of having two G's, and a 48% chance of having a mixture of A and G. The AA people wake up about an hour earlier than people who have the GG, and the AG's wake up basically exactly in the middle. Okay? When investigators went back and looked at people in the study who were enrolled 15 years ago at age 65 and tracked, they found that of the people that had died, the same genotype predicted six hours of the variation in the time of death. In other words, people with A... What was that, Natan? I just coughed. People with AA or AG died before 11 a.m., like most of the population. Those with GG died just before 6 p.m. So, again, causation, correlation, it seems that there is an indication here about what time of day people are more likely to die based on this gene mutation. Yeah, pretty fascinating stuff. Would you want to know this information about yourself? Uh, I, I would. That's fine. Knowing what time of day I might die from natural causes, presumably, in 50 years. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay, fair I enough. I mean, if you told me what what day I would die. Right, this can't tell you I what day. I might not want to know that. Yeah, this won't tell you what right. day. Uh, Fox News' Brian Kilmeade said that the network picks female talent from a Victoria's Secret catalog. I have audio of this. This is from Fox News Radio. Take a listen. I mean, I am so thankful for your show, sir. And, um, Allison, I can't say what I think about Panetta with you on the show. But <laughs> My virgin it, it, ears would not tolerate that. <laughs> no. Well, you and all the women of Fox, I don't know who was the scout that got you guys, but they, they rock. It was Brian. Yeah. But thank you very much. That's very sweet. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it was actually, we went to the Victoria's Secret uh, <laughs> catalog, and we said, can any of these people talk? You're so and they all could, and they all went to college. You're so crazy. Yeah, there you go. Victoria's Secret models should immediately demand an apology from Brian Kilmeade for the suggestion that they are as incompetent as Fox News personalities, don't you think? Well, at the same time, it's kind of like an advertisement. It's almost like they're proud of their lack of journalism. Even though this is obviously fake, the idea that they are hired based on looks suggests they don't really care that we don't really have journalists here. Looks are certainly a factor because there's definitely a lot of consistency there. Let's go to some of your voicemail. 219 David P. Voicemail line open 24 hours a day. Here's a voicemail about Lewis's vocabulary. Take a listen. Hey, I very much enjoy your show. Uh, my name is Ethan Johnson. I'm from Illinois. But I just want to let you know, Lewis needs to change his vocabulary up. He uh, says insane a lot. He should start saying ludicrous or asinine. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Other than that, I'm not going to change nothing about your show. I would not. But uh, That's pretty good. The only complaint... Is Lewis's vocabulary not bad? Well, I mean, I guess it is a, a clinical term. Uh, so maybe is, is that the reason they don't want me using it? Well, or? I think it's just the idea of not using the same one all the time. We'll work on it. All right. Yeah. I do say ridiculous, too. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, asinine could be, I mean, if my microphone cuts out at the wrong time, I, I could be fined by the FCC. Well, so. no, because saying ass is actually okay. It's when you append the other part to the end. That's the word you can't oh, say. Oh, the H part? Exactly. Uh, exactly. Gotcha. All right, uh, here's a voicemail from the Eggman checking in here. Hi, guys. Loving your show. Listen, I heard your interview again with Corporal Klingler. Uh, what's his name? Gordon Klingler Schmidt, the guy from the Army that hates gay people. My question <laughs> would be, oh, God, what the heck was I going to say? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was really, again, he said that um, even though people voted uh, for the legalization of uh, marijuana, he said, you know, people can vote against their own interests, which obviously, you know, all Republicans do. But anyway, my point is, he quotes the Bible to say how horrible homosexuality is. If I uh, read the Bible in English, I read it in Spanish when I was in the hole in prison, but I'm pretty sure there's a verse in there that says, God gave us the herb of the earth to use. I'll say it again. God gave us the herb of the earth to use. Marijuana is the herb of the earth. Who the f*** is Gordon Klingerschmidt to say that it's a drug when half the other sh that we put in our bodies as a drug. I hate that scumbag. All he's doing is using God to further his own sick, f hypocritical, selfish, hateful agenda. He's a piece of shit, and I hope somebody kicks him in the f***ing butt. 
<laughs> I love you guys so much, man. Peace and love. Bye bye. Hey, the other guy. Okay, so Eggman fired Eggman up. Eggman getting fired up. Hey, take I've, it easy, Eggman. I've never never seen him this agitated. I like it. It seems that between his pro-gay views and pro-marijuana views, the Gordon Klingenschmidt interview just almost pushed him over the edge. Eggman, just smoke smoke a joint and take it easy. He's got to relax. I'm seriously worried about the Eggman. That's going to do it for today. Unless you get the bonus show, then the show keeps going. DavidPakman.com slash membership.